without further ado, I would like to introduce my special guest for today. He is a activist, comedian, political commentator. And to be honest with you, I, I'm a little jealous of how perfectly coiffed his hair is. <laughs> the young version of King Trident, Lee Camp, is with us today. Good to see you, Lee. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, like it's uh, the, one out of 10 times does the hair look like it is meant to look like it's most of the time it's just madness, pure madness. So, well, speaking of madness, I mean, we were just all talking off air about Florida and how madly hot it is. And to be honest with you, um, the difference between outside and my armpit, uh, the lines are very blurred right now. So, you know. <laughs> a lot of people call Florida the armpit of the nation. So there's well, that. <laughs> is that all they call it? Because trust me, I can come up with better analogies than that. But um, <laughs> but one of the first questions that I actually have for you that I wanted to get into, and this really is about your political evolution. So. Some know you through the important, important work that you do through political commentary and advocacy. Others know you through the work as a, your work as a comedian. How did your political beliefs evolve into the values you have now? And how greatly did it shape the content of your comedy? Yeah, well, you know, similarly, a lot of people ask me, like, which came first, the activism or the comedy? You know, was I was I a young activist looking for various ways to be active or uh, was I a young comedian? Uh, it started out as pure comedy. I just I just wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to do the uh, the Seinfeld path of of making fun of uh, the shit you see on your desk or in your refrigerator. And I did not think that uh, I would end up, uh, you know, tackling uh, uh, endless war and systemic racism on a daily basis. But as as I uh, went about becoming a comedian, performing every night in New York City uh, at age, you know, 21, 22 and and, and on, uh, I became more active. I became more aware. I became more educated. Uh, the the final so I, I became active and educated and everything uh, in many ways, but the, the final nail in the coffin for me of the two-party system was uh, when Obama got elected the first time. And mm -hmm. I definitely supported him in 2008. And then I realized, like, oh, I see it's all bullshit. Like, all <laughs> bullshit. Right. Definitely. And I saw how his administration and the system worked in two th by 2009, by about one year in. And uh, it kind of shattered the whole idea that, oh, well, if you just got a kind of somewhat left-leaning Democrat in there, it would be a different world and we can just fix it all up and yeah. make it all work. And uh, I found, oh, no, that's not true at all. And instead, you'd have this so-called left-leaning Dem Democrat bragging about how much oil pipeline and, uh, you know, how, how much he's done for for oil uh, exports and, you know, endless wars and bombings in seven countries and his final year in office, the, the year when he could have been, uh, you know, going against the military industrial complex, he dropped 26,000 bombs or the Pentagon did while he was there. And so, you know, that's the most left wing you can hope for on our system. So it kind of blew it all up for me. And, uh, and I went from there. I mean, my, <clears throat> Most of my stances, though, have not really changed since that time, like, you know, maybe some tiny specifics. But in general, I've been saying the same shit since 2009, 2010. But, you know, that doesn't stop people from acting like I have made some kind of crazy pivot because they find one topic they don't like, you know, that that it's amazing how many people will claim to be watching my stuff a lot. And then suddenly they'll see one of my clips on climate crisis and go, oh, I, I can't believe you suddenly decided to believe in this. I, it's like, dude, I've been talking about it <laughs> for 15 years at least. 15 years and you ain't heard a word I just said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is amazing when you, you think it, people claim to watch all your stuff and they haven't, they, haven't heard, they haven't gotten a word. Not a word is sunk in to the thick skull. Yeah, it's almost like you have to be, look, look, hey, 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 listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying, all right? I'm going to make you laugh, and I'm also going to make you think. Think, motherfucker, think. <laughs> Virtual slap across the face, right? Oh, gosh, man. 
Well, you know, uh, that's that's one thing. Uh, and, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> a lot of times when people do not listen to what you say and they're caught off guard, it, it's like, were, were you here just for, you know, for the hee hee and, and ha ha's or were you there for the more deeper parts of my artistry, you know? It's, it's like, because one thing, and I'll be having on Kevin Ronka from Right Brain Studios on a little bit because, you know, he's also into, you know, the media arts as well as a director. But the thing is, is that a lot of times when it comes to artistry, comedy is also part of that art. And a lot of times art is also used as a tool in order to inform as well as entertain. And so, you know, I think that that blend helps but the thing is that people have to be paying attention and sometimes i feel like sometimes we're just too out of sorts to really pay attention yeah that can happen but you, you are right that, that comedy is one of these arts that can be used to influence people or to make them think or to give them new ideas and and part of the reason that i started putting my activism and and my politics into my comedy was it kind of occurred to me, it was like, I'm I'm on stage. I was often, in my early years in New York, I was often on stage three times a night doing, you normally get like a 10 minute set. So it wasn't like we were doing hours every night, but so I was doing three sets a night in front of crowds that didn't know me, didn't know anything about the comedians. They just went into a comedy club to see a comedy show. And uh, so you were not preaching to the choir. You were, you had all sorts of people, uh, especially in New York City. And mm -hmm. it occurred to me, it's like, wow, there is kind of no art form left where you are speaking however you want, no gatekeeper. You get on a stage and mm -hmm. people have shown up to just hear your thoughts. Yeah. Like, you know, there's there's little bits of, you know, there's a few monologists left in the country. There's a few maybe Poets, but but even poets, of course, are usually reading from a script that they've written. But true. But but you know, so if you take like maybe maybe poets, maybe comedians, but th there's almost nothing left where people just walk into a room and say, "Let's hear what's coming out of this guy's noggin." And uh, it. So I was like, well, I think I feel I feel like if I'm going to be doing this rare art form that's still re remaining in in this country. I mean, in, perhaps a lot of what I say should have some sort of deeper meaning, some sort of deeper quest for, for peace and sustainability in a better world. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I feel like as we descend into the madness that is fascism, that uh, really uh, the person who tells the emperor they have no clothes, they're the ones who are basically sent to the dungeon. Uh, to ones who are basically the court jesters of our society that points to the king, so to speak, and says, you know, all the things that we've been thinking, you can't, you can't really do it because then that means that you're challenging the actual status quo of the system that keeps us in the point that we're in, you know, which is why I actually do, I really do feel that comedians, especially ones that punch up, are in more rare form today, which is one of the reasons why I actually want to thank you for the work that you do, because you, you know, consistently punch up at the system and at institutions that are really just horrible for all of us, you know, mankind alike. So thank you. I appreciate that. I, you know, that's, that's what I always try to do. I mean, it, it's interesting that on one hand, you, people go, well, this is, a, this is a real boom time for, for political comedy, you know? The Daily mm -hmm. Show's so big, and there's, there's so many other shows out there. For a while, there were several different news comedy shows out there with John mm -hmm. Oliver and Samantha Bee and these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, people would talk about, like, well, well look, look how influential comedy is. And I'm like, I'm thinking... You know, and don't get me wrong, like Daily Show was pivotal in me kind of learning yeah. comedy and growing and everything. And I definitely worshipped it in my early years of comedy and stuff. But in general, it's like, well, yes, they are informing people perhaps to a better degree than our news is. But at the end of the day, they're still staying in that corporate, you know, corporate wheelhouse. They're still inside of the allowable talking points or they wouldn't be on those networks. 
And yeah. so it, as people would give me that compliment of like, you know, of, of, of being part of that tradition at the same time, I was like, yeah, but also there's a bit of a difference between what I'm doing, which is completely not allowable on our corporate airwaves yeah. and what many are doing, uh, many others are doing. Um, but, you know, I got to I got to give a shout out to kind of just how much different comedians have made over the past many years. Waking sure. people up. You, you do have people like like uh, my friend Katie Halper and Jimmy Dore and uh, uh, what was the oh, and of course, Hannibal Burris bringing down Bill Cosby. Uh, <laughs> these are some big moments, some big moments, big moments, baby. Uh, now, my second question. And, and thank you for that nuanced first question, answer question, I mean. Uh, in your opinion, what kind of improvements can be made on the left to further our collaboration and efficacy to influence more people into class solidarity and consciousness? Uh, stop sucking. So is that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean... Part, part of it is like part, on this channel because you may just get me in trouble, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> no, part of it My is uh, <laughs> part part of it is to have to have more of a game plan, you know, to to, yeah. to think things out and not always be on a back foot reacting. Uh, and yeah. and that is definitely part of the the game plan of the ruling elite is if we're always reacting, if we're just always trying to get activists out of prison for stuff they shouldn't have been locked up for and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should be doing that, but if that's our, our only pursuit, then they're kind of winning because we're running around just trying to, you know, get Julian Assange out of prison and shit. Uh, mm -hmm. So you definitely have to be able to do that while also having kind of larger game plans. But I'd say the, you know, if, it, if I were to nail it down to one thing is about uniting, is about working together on these issues, yep. the issues that we can work together on, because our, the, the internet and, and maybe it's specifically social media, but mm -hmm. it really fosters an environment of just, just hatred and bringing down. Now, mm -hmm. I, of course, I, I'm screaming at, at people all, all live stream long. Like I, I do a lot of attacking uh, at the mainstream media and everyone else that is, uh, that is, you know, enforcing this status quo. But I also try and highlight a lot of where people have come together, where workers are coming together, solidarity. Uh, I know uh, Revolution Blackout Network has, has done a good amount of that, uh, talking about workers coming together and the strikes across the nation and yeah. things like that. I think if we can do a better job of highlighting coming together rather than just like, Let's split it all up. Let, let's see how many ways we can fracture all this shit. Uh, I think that would make a big difference. And of course, that's when you truly become dangerous is, is when you start telling people to unite. You know, that's when the, yeah. the Fred Hamptons of the world get assassinated and the Martin Luther Kings, when they tar start telling, you know, white and black and poor and middle class to get together. That's when it gets dangerous. Yeah, definitely. And that's a really good point. I, I appreciate that, especially how, you know, we have to, you know, build a coalition so that we don't suck anymore. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, so my next question that I have is uh, having to do with the presidential race that we're going through right now. Of course, you have people like, you know, Dr. Cornell West, RFK Jr., Marianne Williamson, um, Ramaswamy, I forgot his first name, um, Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, and then you have people like Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis. W you know, as, what are your who's, thoughts? Who's on this uh, young Donald Trump whippersnapper? Can you tell me a little more about him? What's Oh, uh, God, Ron DeSantis? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, Please do not make me throw up in a little bit in my mouth on my own show. I just, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, of course, know all about those clowns. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, that nobody really wants to hear about that hemorrhoid. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, speaking of hemorrhoid. Uh, I, uh, let's, let's be sensitive. I think it's themroid. No. No. <laughs> Between him and Biden, I mean, my gosh, you know, I mean, they make your ass itch in, in all the most horrible ways imaginable. But 
What is your thoughts on the recent opinions regarding RFK Jr. Uh, and his thoughts on Israel, Palestine? And do you think he could be swayed by journalists like Max Blumenthal? Uh, you, so you basically mean swayed by facts? Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> I mean, no, I, I'm just saying. <laughs> so I, so I, I've probably done uh, – four or five segments since I on, on highlighting RFK uh, since he started running. And for most of them, uh, I think all but two, maybe. Uh, so I've probably done five and probably three of them, three to four of them are, are highlighting the, the third rails he's grabbing that presidential candidates in the main two parties, especially are not allowed to talk about things like going after big ag or things like separating the corporations from the state which is what we have. We have, you know, the, the colloquial term might be corporatocracy, but inverted totalitarianism. Um, and so I'm highlighting those things in a positive way. But the, the negatives of RFK Jr. are really adding up now. Uh, first yeah. of all was when he said he'd take money from absolutely anywhere. He basically put a big for sale sign up on his forehead and uh, said, yeah, I need, I need money from anywhere, any corporations, anyone else wants to send me money, just send it away. And it's, it's that we know how that system works. We've seen that system. It always ends in the same way. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, so to get to your Israel question, he has just been atrocious on Israel. And it's not even like there could be a kind of defendable area where if he were saying, Look, Israel, you know, the, the bullshit line about Israel is a right to exist, but I don't know a lot about it. And, you know, I, I, I think I think we, we go too hard on Israel, but I don't know a lot about it. Like he could have charted out that kind of weird territory. And right. instead, he has gone full on into just spouting the farthest right wing crazy propaganda that just a, like a Wikipedia search or <laughs> is wrong is not true all kinds of crap about palestinians getting streets named after him for killing a, a jew anywhere in the world and all this stuff like it's just garbage the other day he said uh, that that israel gave back the golan heights to syria even though golan heights is still occupied to this day just so it's just right-wing garbage and to me what it's what it shows is Either that he's lying, in which case he's willing to just lie because he thinks it's the easiest way to get elected is to stay in that pro-Israel camp and take money. He's, he's got to be getting money from the, the big Israel donors. Uh, but I think more. I think the other thing is if it's not a lie, then it's just how easily he's manipulated, how easily someone said to him, hey, look at this. And he said, OK, sure. Uh, so either one is a, a giant indictment of kind of everything he is supposedly fighting for. Yeah. And my thing is, is that if he can easily be swayed by the Israel, the Israel lobby, then he could be swayed by the joint chiefs of staff. He could be swayed by the CIA. He can be swayed by the Pentagon. He can be swayed by Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. Oh. And, you know, so the thing is, is that, you know, it's like if you can be swayed by those, what makes you think that I'm going to going to be able to trust you to stick to your guns when it comes to other issues that you may sound very good on, but you you can be swayed on this. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's true. And and you mentioned the CIA, which is another weird one. On one hand, he's said something that is very dangerous to say, which is that his uncle, he's basically said his uncle was killed by the CIA, uh, mm -hmm. JFK. And, you know, that's a dangerous thing to say. But on the other hand, he also seems to very much defend the CIA, where he says, oh, I need to, I would fix it as president, but... You know, my daughter-in-law's ex-CIA and the CIA is filled with thousands of wonderful, brave men and women. And so he just basically says, oh, they may have assassinated a president, but, you know, they're still good folks. Like, <laughs> it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre take. It's a hot take. They can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and they wouldn't lose any votes. What does that sound like? Really. You know, I mean, gosh. Anyway, <laughs> we can go all day on that one because that that just whew, I was just like, what? I mean, there's some very sus. Even even me saying that is just 
you know, even me saying that is putting it lightly, but it's whatever. Um, my next question is, what do you think the chances of Biden making it to the general election without being replaced by Gavin Newsom? Because let's be real. Gavin Newsom's running a shadow campaign. Mm-hmm. I, I'm f- thoroughly convinced of that. Um, my comrade, Savvy Sab, she talked about it as well on her channel that she thinks that it's a shadow campaign. He is going to be having a debate against Ron DeSantis during the presidential election season while Ron DeSantis is running for president. Why in the world would you want to debate him if you're not running a campaign? Your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's very possible. Uh, there's been a lot of talk of Gavin Newsom. I mean, Biden is, is 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 he's having trouble putting together whole sentences, but he's also having trouble just walking into the room. <laughs> and so, I don't like even without just joking about it. I don't know how you fake that presidential campaign if the guy can barely give a speech, uh, even from a teleprompter. I, I don't really know how you do that. So. It is possible that they're kind of just prepping this. It's also possible that they're just thinking, well, we'll have we'll have Gavin Newsom in the wings in case something happens, in case Biden dies, in case Biden falls off a, s- a stage and bashes his head. Like, who knows? But you basically, we'll just have him ready. He'll be the understudy. He'll be waiting in the wings. Uh, so it, it might not necessarily be like the whole Democratic establishment just knows that he's that it's going to be Gavin Newsom, but. I mean, to be honest with you, I honestly do think that somebody brought this out. Um, I think it was on Savvy Sab show was that they think that Joe Biden is going to become the nominee. And then as soon as he becomes the nominee, he steps down and then chooses his successor, that being Gavin Newsom. Because we all know that Kamala Harris <laughs> is not going. See, you're allergic to Kamala, just like me. See, <laughs> um, you know when she tries to step. I, I honestly think they had that conversation already. Like Kamala, you're not going to be the next president because well, nobody yeah. likes her. Yeah, and no, Gavin Newsom has so some popularity in California. Yeah, I mean. I do. I do think that they absolutely would use the new uh, the new nuclear option that they put into the DNC's bylaws. Uh, I, I it was basically after Bernie's first run, so it was you know maybe 2018 or somewhere around there. They put in a new thing into the bylaws that the DNC chair could stop any nominee from being the nominee if they were not shown to be democratic in their writing and speeches just shown to be really part of the party so i think that they would now it is a nuclear option because it would piss off the entirety of the voters that had voted for this person in the primary but i could see them using that nuclear option against rfk jr if he were to win the primary and basically he's supposed to be the nominee for the dnc uh they could point to that and say, well, he's not democratic enough, so we're not picking him. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it, it would, it would blow up their, their system, but they might just do that rather than have, I don't know, RFK or someone as, uh, as the nominee. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now I have my, my final question. This isn't even my final form. Okay. Final question is, <laughs> The West African nations of Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso have given a middle finger to the West and are pushing their own self-determination and sovereignty. What sequence (laughs) of events do you think that may happen by the hand of the West, particularly the U.S. and France, to put these nations back under their yoke? Yeah, well, the U.S. has a lot of different tools in the toolbox for cooing or recooing countries that have stepped outside of the of their control. Uh, obviously, France is very involved in this one as well. Um, but the thing that the, the the U.S. and France have already talked about sending more troops. Now, of course, the U.S. Have a, has a base there, so technically, it already has troops. The U.S. already has troops in Niger, but they've talked about sending more troops to you know keep the peace or whatever terminology they use, bring democracy to, uh, to invading <laughs> a, a country. But what, the, what is throwing a wrench in the gears is that 
Mali and Burkina Faso have said if another country were to invade Niger, they would then consider an act of war. And the U.S. and France don't want to be in a five-country war. Um, so it seems that the U.S. and France will probably more likely use their other tools in the toolbox, which mm -hmm. can also be deadly, such as economic war, sanctions, uh, various soft power techniques, obviously endless propaganda, which has already begun. Um, there's a lot that can be done, and I think we should watch as it, much of it is done. Lawfare really is the, is the tool of choice of the U.S. empire in the most recent uh, years. It's very rare that we nowadays just go and shoot a president because they're in our way. What's far more common is is getting the the uh, you know various governmental bodies in that country, bribing them to bring some sort of charges against the president or the person running or whoever, and get them either kicked out of office or arrested. Uh, we saw it with Lula, who then undid that. Luckily, uh, we saw it with. Um, with uh, just the other day, Emron Khan was sentenced to three years in prison in Pakistan. The U.S. fingerprints were all over that lawfare coup that got him kicked out of power. We saw it in uh, Peru with Castillo, who's in prison right now. We saw it in, uh, in, in Argentina, where they brought charges against the vice presidential, uh, the vice president. And the reason they did that is because they knew she was going to run for president next and the U.S. and other right wing nations didn't want her to be president. So they figured, well, we'll bring charges against her, which in their country, once you've been charged uh, or found guilty of of various crimes, you can't run for office. So or for president. So they have successfully stopped her from becoming president. So they've had a lot of lawfare wins in in these coup light situations and i think that they'll probably uh you know do their best to use those type of things in niger but it is certainly more complicated when it's a military coup and you yeah. know but well they did the same thing in burkina faso against sankara you know back then so i mean they literally took one of his friends and then they used him through you know uh bribery and influence and then they end up killing sankara so if they did it before, then that's something that I think they'll do again as well. Yeah, yeah, there are there are a lot of options. I think the reason they've shied away from the assassinations is just because people are getting better at uh, investigating those things. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot more people talking about it that are against the empire, for sure. So yeah, but, but yeah, the, the final part of that answer is that the fact that Niger and Mali and Burkina Faso and so many of these other countries are standing up to the U.S.-led dominance of the world is a, a major step, and it speaks to the waning power of the U.S. empire. Now, you know, if, if maybe there'd be an argument of how wonderful the U.S. empire was if it created sustainability and happiness around the world, but instead oh. we just see that we are driving off a cliff uh, we're on the brink of nuclear war. There's billions upon billions of people starving around the world. And so the U.S. empire having as much power as it has is absolutely a bad thing. It's a terrible thing for humanity, for the planet. And so these countries standing up and showing the waning power of the U.S., uh, 41 countries, is it now, want to join BRICS, the competing monetary system. Uh, these are all big steps in a massive shift of the geopolitical economic and and otherwise order yeah 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 and, and that was my last question look uh i appreciate your political commentary your analysis because it is very nuanced and is very insightful so i appreciate you coming on uh please let everybody know where they can find you as well yeah um let's see i got a bunch of things to tell people about i have uh my first global Zoom comedy show that I'll be doing September 2nd. Uh, it's a Saturday, and that's at LeeCamp.com. Uh, most everything's at LeeCamp.com, so you can check it out there. Uh, but so if you want to see the comedy show, uh, check that out. But also, I am the campaign manager for a uh, grayish-brown rock that I'm running for president of the United States. 
And I think it would just be much better than anybody we've ever had sitting in the Oval Office. So that's at yardrock2024.com. And uh, I think people should go check out the platform of uh, Yard Rock 2024 and uh, see what he stands for because it's uh, some some good shit, you know? Wow. Okay. Thank you so very much for informing me and the audience about that. I very much appreciate it. So just as well, if anybody would like to, you guys can also go to the links down in the description below to get all the links to uh, to Lee Camp as well. You could also have links to his YouTube channel as well as to his Twitter. So if he says anything right, then you can high five him in the, in the comments on YouTube as well. Lee Camp, it was a pleasure and it was a privilege to have you. Thank you so much for coming. You're too kind, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you all the luck with your with your show as it continues. So thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.